Well, it is Palm Sunday. We are celebrating uh, not only the event of the riding into Jerusalem as king, but we are celebrating some of the last moments of Jesus' life before the crucifixion. So this is our second to last uh, message in the Resurrect series, and it starts with uh, a picture of Jesus, or, or several pictures of Jesus. And one of the one of the hobbies that I've been enjoying for the last couple of years is I've taken up watercolor. And, uh, you know, I'm no master artist, but I enjoy putting a picture on a paper, particularly something that I've seen or taken a picture of, and then trying to put that into a watercolor. And the way that you do watercolor is you start with areas that are going to be dark, but you put a light coat on to start with. And then as you continue, you start darkening certain areas. And it's amazing. It can look, just look like a, a flat uh, surface, like there's no dimension to it. And then you start adding shadows. And the shadows and the, the highlights and the darks and the lights start bringing it out so it begins to look like something that has depth. And so the, the title of our message today is Clarifying Contrasts. And that's exactly what I mean by that, is by showing some different pictures, like contrasting pictures of Jesus, I want you to walk out of here today with a, a deeper view of Jesus, and because of that, that it would move your heart, and you would go, oh man, Jesus is so amazing, and I love him, and, and this week before Easter would be one of, of great opportunities of worship. And so the, the triumphal entry comes down what's called the Mount of Olives. I've been down this number of times, and right, it's a very steep hill, and and there's a cemetery there and walls there that were never there. But it's the same hill that Jesus rode down on a donkey, which we might think is sort of a, a sad symbol, but it was a symbol of a king riding in. And it was the time when people went kind of crazy and grabbed branches and put their clothes down in front of the donkey so that, so that he would be celebrated and honored. And so we have one picture of Jesus, which shows how he was at least by some perceived to be powerful and high and mighty. They, they were calling him the king. And there's a, a, a church that's halfway down. You can see it in this picture. It's just halfway down the mountain. And if you go inside that church, it's got this big picture window, and it looks out over the city of Jerusalem. And it's there that Jesus stopped, and it says that he wept over Jerusalem. Here all these people are cheering, and, and there's this, this high moment where it seems like he's being given his due. And he stops, and he cries, and he said, you, you didn't understand the day of your visitation. You didn't know when the Messiah was here, and how I wished that I, that I could have drawn you in. And, and then he even makes prophecy about when every stone is going to be thrown down and the city of Jerusalem is going to be destroyed, which, which actually happened many years later, well, 40 years later. So here you see Jesus as God, and yet there's this beautiful contrast in John chapter 13. If you have your Bibles, turn there. And it shows that Jesus is both incredibly high and powerful, and he is God in the flesh, but he also is very humble. And this is one of those beautiful pictures when Jesus gathers around uh, the, the upper room with his disciples celebrating the, the Passover feast. And he takes a moment to set for all time how we are to use the gifts that God's given us and the, the greatness, whatever greatness we have. And so John 13, verse 3, it says, and it was just before the Passover festival and Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave the world and to go to the Father. And having loved his own, he now loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. And Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God, and that he was returning to God. And so... What would you think the next phrase would be when you, when you see that he's ridden into town on the donkey, that he has shown that he's the Messiah by weeping over Jerusalem and prophesying what's going to happen? And then he says, I know clearly, and I want you to get this phrase. He says that 
all things, he, he knew that God had put all things under his authority. Jesus had a crystal clear idea of what was happening and that this valley of death that he was walking through was going to result in his being glorified and the world being saved. And it says, knowing that he came from God and that he was going back to God and having a clear identity, and then it says, so he got up from the meal and took off his outer clothing and he wrapped a towel around his waist. And after that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. And I don't know if you can actually imagine, I don't know if any of us can actually imagine, but if you can see Jesus, for whom you finally understand that he is the Messiah, and he comes and he takes off his outer cloak, and you know, you think about feet in our day, and, and there are some churches that practice this as a service where they wash each other's feet. And you know what everybody does before they go to the service like that? Yeah, they wash their feet. And we're not talking about feet that are a little bit sweaty. We're talking about they're walking in open-toed sandals, and they're walking in a way that horses and donkeys and even raw sewage gets thrown out and the garbage in the streets and the dust and the, the mess. And these feet are filthy. And, and Jesus gets down, and I don't know if you can imagine him getting down in front of you, but he knelt in front of each of the disciples and he would take the water and he would look them in the eye and he would take their feet and he would begin to wash it. And that, this, was the, this was the job for the lowest servant. This was a, a completely reversal of his status. And I think of how it says that Judas had already agreed to betray him. And Jesus washed Judas's feet. And then he comes to Peter. And Peter, you know, he, he has his heart in the right place, but he has his foot mostly in his mouth. And... Uh, and he says, Lord, you're not going to wash my feet. And I'm sure he meant it in a totally honoring way. Like, that wouldn't be fitting for you, the, the Lord and Savior, to wash my feet. And Jesus just looks at him and, and challenges him. And he says, you know, <laughs> unless I wash your feet, you have no part of me. He, he, uh, he knew that Peter didn't do subtle. So he just hits him straight between the eyes and says, if, I, if you don't let me wash your feet, then you're no part of mine. And of course, then Peter jumps from one ditch to the opposite and says, oh, not just my feet, but my head and my hands as well. And Jesus said something very important. He said, the one who's taken a bath that is already clean doesn't need their whole body washed again. And he's using a metaphor of, of not only that he was going to create a way in which we could be totally forgiven for our sin, but he also understood and created the picture that, that we walk in a dirty world and that we, we don't even know how to confess our sin because there's so many and they're shot in every part of our lives. And so he was saying that the washing of our feet is a great picture and a symbol for the fact that we confess our sins and that 1 John 1.9 says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and he forgives us our sins and he cleanses us from all unrighteousness. And then, after he gets up from the meal, it says in verse uh, 12, he says, Do you understand what I've done for you? I'm sure that the room was awkward. I don't know if anybody's ever washed your feet, but it's a very intimate and very humbling experience. And he says, You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that's what I am. Don't forget that I am high. But he says, now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should also wash one another's feet. That servant heart toward each other, encouraging each other, challenging each other, being there in the toughest times, he says, that's what I want you to do. So I want you to see that picture of Jesus, that he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, but he is also the one who knelt and individually washed the feet of every one of the disciples. I don't think they ever forgot it. I don't think they, they recovered from that because that was a picture of Jesus that they really were not used to. And that is also a great description as we talk about the Passover and the communion service, which we are celebrating today. And the contrast I want to bring your attention to is the old and the new. So Jesus is at this point celebrating the festival that the Jewish people have been celebrating for almost 1,500 years. 
And the Passover was focused on the past. It was focused on the old. It was a reminder of what God had done when he took the children of Israel out of slavery. And the, the Passover today is done with uh, a very special plate, and Jewish families all have a special Seder plate or a, a plate for Passover, and it's got different elements that have been added. Some of them have added over the years. But the essence of the Passover celebration was unleavened bread, which Jesus talks about, the bread, and then the cups of wine that actually there were four cups of wine that they took during the Passover. And all of this was focused on the unleavened bread was a picture of that they had to be ready to leave in haste when they were leaving Egypt. And so they couldn't wait for bread to rise. They had to be ready to just take it with them. And then the, the Jewish people drink four cups, four drinks during the meal. And each of them represent the statements that, that God made to Moses when he sent him down. He said, tell the people of Israel, I will bring you out. Tell them I will free you from the slavery. Tell them that I will redeem you. And tell them that I will make you my people. And so for each of those promises, they drink and remember what God said in the promise. And they take that unleavened bread and they, they take it and they break it off and they eat it. In fact, all kinds of other breads. Israel today has amazing breads. But on the week, uh, on Shabbat and on the week of Passover, they actually clean their whole houses, they clean the motels, they clean everything out of anything that might contain yeast or leaven. And so they still have that picture that they are looking, but they are looking in the rearview mirror. They are looking at what happened before. And so Jesus is going through this Passover, and he is saying all the traditional words that these Jewish boys have grown up with ever since they were young. And it's like he goes off script. It's kind of like if somebody were to say, I pledge allegiance to the... And you're expecting the same words that you've heard your whole life. Only they said, I pledge allegiance to the king of the universe and I will follow him forever. And you'd think, well, that's not the pledge of allegiance. I guess it is a pledge of allegiance. And that's kind of like what happened here is that Jesus took the symbol that had actually been lying in their culture for 1,500 years and that Jesus is the perfect fulfillment of the Passover celebration of the Passover lamb. And so he is looking not to the past, to the old. He is looking to the new. And in Luke chapter 22, it says, After taking the cup, he gave thanks. And he said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you that I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And so we think that's probably one of the earlier cups in the meal. And then it says, he took the bread, and he gave thanks, and he broke it, and he said, this is my body. He didn't talk about Exodus. He didn't talk about the, the, the day when they had to leave in a hurry. He said, this is my body that's broken for you. As often as you remember, as often as you eat it, remember me. Now, I think a lot of times the disciples just went like, I don't know what he's talking about. How could this be his body when his body was still there? He said, it's broken for you, and it's like, it looks fine to me. So clearly Jesus is setting them up for what we celebrate as the Lord's Supper or as communion. And he's setting them up to understand that this Passover was a deeply significant uh, celebration that had been pointing to Jesus all the time. And in fact, unleavened bread, the idea of yeast or of leaven becomes a picture of sin. And so Jesus is the only truly unleavened bread. He is the one who brought righteousness into the world and he had no sin in him. And so he took the bread and he broke it. And then he said, in the same way, after supper, he took the cup. And we think this is probably the third cup, the cup of redemption, which would be so appropriate. And he says, not this cup reminds us of the statements that God made to Moses, but this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Again, I think they would have been clueless. Jesus' blood was all in his body at that point. 
But he's looking to the future. He's looking to the new. He's setting a symbol that Christians all over the world for the last 2,000 years have used to set our hearts and our minds right, to be prepared to remember because the things that are so important we can't afford to forget. And so he, he takes the cup and he says, this is the blood of the new covenant. Now, the blood of the old covenant was when they took a lamb and part of the Passover celebration and passed. In fact, interestingly enough, the very day in which Jesus rode into Jerusalem would have been the day that they brought all of the lambs for the priests to examine them to see if they were actually without blemish, without spot, without a problem. And Jesus rode in and was examined by the authorities. But when he talked about the blood of the new covenant, the way they sacrificed, the way that they observed Passover the first time was that it was the tenth of tenth pl ten plagues and God said, I'm going to send my death angel and he's going to fly over. And any household that doesn't have the blood of the lamb on the door, those households, the oldest is going to die, the oldest son. And so they very, very carefully took the lamb just as was commanded and they killed the lamb and they took the, the blood in a bowl and they took a plant, a hyssop plant and, and painted it on the side of the door, on the other side of the door and on the lintel at the top and then they got inside and they had seen God do amazingly powerful things and I don't think, I think they believed that God was going to come. And so the death angel passed over the houses where the blood was applied to the door. This is a very significant story in my life because this was a part of my mother's salvation experience. She is the, the spiritual root in the, the Glazner family, and she has led my dad and much of his family to Christ, and she was instrumental in all of her children's lives. But when she was a teenager, she heard a presentation by a college group that came to her youth group, and they talked about this story of putting the lamb's blood on the door. And they said, you know, this is a good picture for people who are almost there but not quite. So say somebody took the lamb and they just tied it outside the door and they thought, that's a cute lamb, I don't want to hurt it. And so they just put it outside the door. And they said, that's like people who are relying on their own good works. They're, they're trying to do the best they can and just hoping that, that that's okay with God but they are not followers of Jesus. They have not received salvation. And then they said, what if, what if somebody took and cut the lamb's throat and took the blood, but they just put the blood by the door? And they said, that's somebody who maybe believes in the facts of the case. They, they believe that actually God is powerful and that, that the lamb has been slain, that Jesus died for our sins. They even believe he rose again, but they have never invited him to control their lives. They've never surrendered to him. They have never applied the blood to the doorposts of their home, of their, of their heart. And my mom said, the Holy Spirit right then whispered, Peggy, that's you. And the conviction of the Spirit, not from the lesson, but from the Spirit said, you are so close, you know all the words about Jesus, but you have never surrendered. You have never repented of your sins and invited Christ into your life. And so Jesus was pointing not only to the past, he was pointing to the future of all of us who will come to believe in Jesus and to, in that same way, this is the new covenant where we put the blood of the sacrificed lamb and Jesus is the perfect Passover lamb, only he, he gave his life once for all. It doesn't have to happen year after year after year. And so, it's very significant, and we are going to share communion in just a moment. And I want you to think about that question is, have I really applied the blood of the Lamb to the door of my life? Have I really surrendered to Him? So, the first contrast was Jesus is both the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and He was also the washer of disciples' feet, the high and the humble. And He was the one who was pointing to the past and how it was actually laying the foundation for him. And then he's looking to the future and laying 
the, the celebration of what we call communion to be a, a constant reminder for the last 2,000 years of Jesus who has said that he would bring us out from slavery, that he would set us free, that he would redeem us, and that he would call us a people of his own. So the, the new covenant is different than the old covenant, but it's built on the foundation of it. And then one last contrast I want to show you, and that is Jesus' love. It says he loved his disciples and he loved them to the end. And I think it's so beautiful to see how God's tender care for the, the disciple that probably caused him the most difficulty, and that is Peter. And so there's a story around the Passover where Jesus tells his disciples at the Passover meal, I'm going to be I'm going to be taken. I'm going to suffer. And he, he's told them before, but it seems like they believe him in a new way. And, and then he looks directly at Simon. And he says, Simon, 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 Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And then he says something so cool. He says, and when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. So, he looks at him directly, and he's in front of a room full of people, and he says, Simon, Satan's trying to mess with you, and I am praying for you. And then he says, and you're going to fail. But then he gives him grace and a picture of grace for the future. He says, but when you have turned back, then strengthen your brothers. And of course, Peter is full of confidence, but it is full of confidence in himself. He is Peter-centered. And so he says, Lord, I am ready to go with you to prison and to death. And Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny three times that you even know me. How do you think Peter felt about that? Man. I mean, Jesus looks right at him and says, no, actually, Peter, you're going to make the biggest failure of your life tonight. And Peter was confident that he was going to be willing even to die with Jesus so clearly he understood what Jesus was saying. And then Jesus made kind of a cryptic comment about getting swords, and clearly Peter took that to heart. So he had a sword. And in the Garden of Gethsemane, when, when the soldiers come with their torches and Judas comes up and he kisses, Peter on, or kisses Jesus on the cheek, Peter pulls out his sword and he's ready to defend Jesus. And it says in, in kind of a serious comic thing, that he's swinging his sword and he doesn't do much good except he takes off an ear of the high priest's servant. And so Jesus turns around and looks at him again and he says, put your sword back in its place. For all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Do you think I can't call on my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? Now just in case you're wondering about numbers, 12 legions is about 6,000 angels. And we know from some Old Testament stories that one angel can kill 100,000 people. So that's plenty, plenty of strength. And you see there you have the high and the low again. Jesus said, you know what? I'm letting them take me, but it is not because I'm weak. He said, I could call for legions of angels, write that. But then how would the Scripture be fulfilled that say it must happen in this way? And you know, when we are in Israel. There's a beautiful little chapel. It's a fairly new uh, church. And it is called Ingalakantu, which is Latin for the crowing of the rooster. And if you know that story about Peter's evening, Jesus looks at him and he says, you're going to fail. And then he's arrested. And, and I think so Peter feels bad. He tried to help him and God and Jesus said, knock it off, Peter, put your sword away. I think he felt confronted and belittled and confused. So three different times that night, and in this beautiful chapel, there is a, a very impressive statue. And on the top of the statue is a rooster. And around the base of that statue, it shows a soldier and two servants and Peter. And there were three different times that people said, weren't you with Jesus? Aren't you one of his disciples? In fact, the last one, a, a woman said, I can tell by your accent, you're from Galilee. You, you were with him. 
And Peter starts, he denies him three times, and then he starts calling down curses and saying, I never knew the man. And right then the rooster went, cock a doodle doo. And he began to go, oh, exactly what Jesus said happened. Exactly what he said. And I think Peter went out thinking he was the biggest failure ever, thinking he was off the team, thinking that was his last chance. And you know, I've blown it, I've sinned, I've failed Jesus. <laughs> but when I was standing there in Israel, I thought, you know what? There is not a church in Israel built to my failure to hold it. Don't you think he flinched a little bit every time you saw a rooster after that? And the beautiful part about this story is Jesus' grace that Jesus was not afraid to confront Peter and say, here's the problem, is you think it's all about you, Peter. But then when he had risen from the dead and he told the women, he said, go tell them I'm alive. Tell the disciples and Peter. Why? Because I don't think Peter would have thought he was still on the team. And so Jesus clearly included him. And then there's this really poignant moment when Jesus meets the disciples again after he's raised from the dead and he joins them when they're fishing in Galilee. And he takes Peter aside for a little conversation. And he says, Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, yeah, Lord, you know I do. And then he asks him again. And Peter says, yeah, I love you. And some people think Jesus gave him a chance to restate his love for Jesus for the three times that he had denied him. I don't know if that's true, but that's a beautiful symmetry. And on the third time, Jesus asked him, even with a different word, do you even really like me, Peter? And it says Peter was ashamed and dismayed. But he said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And in this beautiful picture, I think it shows us that Jesus knows that we fail. He knows that we are going to fail, that Satan desires to sift us like wheat, but Jesus is still praying for us that we might not fail. I mean, we'll fail, but that our faith might not fail. And I hope this has been a really helpful meditation on Jesus and that the contrasts have created a deeper and richer picture of Jesus. But as we celebrate communion today, I want you to think about how these pictures change our picture. So I'm going to use the unleavened bread and the juice that I have here. Whatever you have at home, if you have some bread or crackers or whatever, if you've got some wine or some juice, you might even just pause it for a minute and go get them. But I want to lead you to think about how these stories make our communion richer. So Jesus said, this is my body that's broken for you. That salvation to us is free, but for Jesus it was very, very costly. But that his salvation, here his crucifixion paid for our sin. So one of the important pictures as we head towards communion is Jesus said, if you've been cleaned, if you've been taken a bath, you don't need to have a bath again. You just need to have your feet washed. And that's a great picture of the confessing of our sins. That when we come to communion, it says we're to come with a, a right heart, a worshipful heart, a remembering Jesus. And so it's a great opportunity for us to say, Lord, examine my heart. Don't just immediately think, oh, I said something bad or I did that. Let the Holy Spirit point out things in your life because sin, we can't possibly confess all of our sin. But the Spirit begins to raise those things up that He wants to deal with and we can confess them and he's washing our feet as we do that. And so, what a powerful picture of seeing Jesus washing my feet, my dirty feet, and getting my heart right and getting into that place of, of understanding what it means. And even the picture of the rooster, maybe you have things in their past that, that you feel are deeply shameful, but you don't believe God could ever forgive you. And I, I want the picture of the rooster to be an encouragement that God has provided in Jesus a sacrifice that is sufficient to any of our failures, any of our sins. And I want you just to take that, that bread and that cup and I want you to think about those promises that God said to Moses 
I will bring you out of slavery. I will set you free. I will redeem you. And I will make you my people. And those are exactly the thing, same things that he says to us with his sacrificial love to us. And so I want you to take the cracker and the juice and I'm going to lead us in prayer. And then when you are ready and you think about his body that's broken for us and his blood that was shed for us, and that's what gives us our freedom. That's what redeems us. That's what makes us the children of God. So let's pray together. Father, I pray that these pictures of Jesus might just make us love you more, make us realize what a rich depth there is to this story of what you have done for us and how you knew hundreds of years ahead of time what you were going to do. And the, the Passover lamb was a, a way to not only predict what was going to happen, but for Jesus to step in and to fulfill it perfectly. And he is our unleavened bread and he is the cup of the covenant and he is our Passover lamb. And God, we say thank you for the forgiveness of our sins and thank you for the suffering that you went through and thank you for the resurrection that shows us your power and your glory. And God, we want to do this in remembrance of you. Let's take a moment and eat and drink in the name of Jesus. We like to end this with a transformational moment. When I say that, I mean we not only want to take this picture of Jesus and have it make us feel so loved and so cared for, but we also want to say, how do I become more like Jesus? How, does, how do the, the examples that he gives and how does his power within me, how does that make a change for me? And maybe as you think about his washing of the disciples' feet, you think about humility and we are so tending to get our identity and our, our worth and our value from what people think of us or how much we accomplish or how nice our car is or all kinds of other idols. And you realize what matters is I know who I belong to, that that's my identity. And then the idea of washing somebody's feet. Jesus said, you've seen what I've done for you. Now you should do that for each other. And some of that has to do with just loving each other and serving and caring and giving and, and becoming that kind of incredibly generous people. And then the picture, of course, of the rooster reminds us of God's grace. And for some of you, you need to really believe that God has forgiven you, that he's taken away your sin no matter what the failure you struggle with, that he is sufficient to forgive but I think for some of us, communion should also be a time when we look at our heart toward other people. Is there somebody that you're hating, somebody that you're angry with, somebody that you haven't resolved things with? And you look at the grace that God gave to Peter and the grace that God gave to me, and that should create in us a, such a, a willingness to forgive, to extend the grace that we need. I like the quote that says, the one who will not forgive burns the bridge over which he himself must pass. And when we receive grace from God, he asks us then to pass it on to others. So I think these stories, if you reflect on them, will not only be draw you closer to Jesus, but will draw more of Jesus' character into you as his spirit reminds you all week. So think about these things. Ask yourself, which one do I need to focus on most? Where's the Holy Spirit going? That's you. And then respond with obedience. Thanks for joining us. Hope you have a wonderful rest of your Sunday. Love you.